When I was in fourth grade, I remember I was for the first time assigned to write what I would call a real book report. That book report was assigned like this. Find a historical figure you admire and write a report about that person. So of course, I chose Walt Disney. <laughs> and back in 1984, when I was in fourth grade, if you had to write a report, some of you may remember these days, you went to a book like this. You know what I'm holding up right here? What's that? That is an encyclopedia, an encyclopedia. Now, if you were born after, say, the year 2000, you're like, what is an encyclopedia? Let me explain, ladies and gentlemen. An encyclopedia is not just one book. It is a set of volumes, and it's just page after page, article after article, talking about all kinds of knowledge, world history, language, arts, science. Basically, if you wanted to know something, this is probably your number one resource. You go to an encyclopedia. Well, as I grew older, things began to change in our world, didn't they? In the early 90s, this wonderful thing called the internet came online, and it just transformed how we thought of information, how we received it. I mean, a set of encyclopedias, like the gold standard for encyclopedias is called Encyclopedia Britannica, all 32 volumes, the most recent edition. Back in 1984, you know how much those volumes cost you? It was over $1,200 for a set of encyclopedias. They were really, really expensive. But in 2001, something was founded, it was put online that was entirely free called Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the world's largest online dictionary or online encyclopedia. And the amount of information on Wikipedia absolutely dwarfs what is found in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica has 44 million words. Wikipedia at last count had about 37.5 billion words, 850 times the amount of information available, and it doesn't cost anything, it's free. What a difference. The amount of information that's available to us is just exploding. It's everywhere. It comes from us from television, newspapers, books, the internet, things like social media and apps and web pages. There's so much of it we could never in our lifetime ever understand it, consume it, and discern it all. It's just far too much, which leaves us with this dilemma. The dilemma is we are actually drowning in information, but we're starving for truth. Let me say that again. We are drowning in information, and yet we are starving for truth. Because here's the thing, information is not truth. Information is just, well, it's a lot of things. Information is facts, it's opinions. Sometimes it's outright lies, because there's a such thing as false information. Those things are not necessarily truth. And so trying to discern truth and make sense of what does this all mean is incredibly difficult. It's one of the most difficult things in navigating our world. Last week, as Pastor Chris began this message series that we're continuing today called Battle Ready, he reminded us of something. Every one of us is in a battle. Those battles take a lot of different shapes. Some of them are health battles, and those health battles can be physical. They can be mental. Some battles are relationship battles, like a marriage battle or a battle with a neighbor or a boss. Financial battles. All these different battles at their heart are spiritual battles, every one of them. And Pastor Chris reminded us last week, he said, don't put your eyes on another human being as your adversary. That's exactly what our enemy wants. Our enemy wants us to look at another person as our adversary and turn our, our spouse or our boss, our neighbor, a friend, somebody, we want to... We want to make them, we want to demonize them and say they're the problem. That group of people, that, that, that political bent, they're the enemy. Friends, that is engaging in a fleshly battle. The Apostle Paul wants us to put our eyes on something else, a spiritual battle, what lies beneath. And that's what we're really looking at today. We are in a battle, and whether we know it or not, it is a spiritual battle. And if you're sitting here and you're like nodding your head, you're like, yep. I do battle every day. I don't know what the circumstance in your life might be, but many of you, I can see you. And right now, I see people nodding because you're right in the middle of a white, hot battle in your life. And then some of you are sitting there like, no, you know, things are pretty good in my life. Well, Pastor Chris reminded us last week, just wait. It's coming. The battle, whether we know it, it's already here. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. But here's the beautiful thing. God doesn't expect us to fight this alone or unarmed. He gives us his spirit, and he gives us tools like we see Apostle Paul describe 
in Ephesians right here. And specifically, he's giving us these tools that he refers to as the armor of God. And today we're going to look at something very specific called the belt of truth. The belt of truth. And we're going to seek answers to three crucial questions today. Those three questions are this. First of all, what is truth? Secondly, why do we need truth? And then lastly, how can we be equipped with truth? As you're able, will you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We're in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And as you're seated, will you pray with me over this Word? Lord, we thank you for your Word. We believe that there is a plan in this word here for us. And so we're asking for three things. We ask for wisdom to be able to understand the message, the true message behind these words that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write to us. Secondly, Lord, we're asking for discernment. We want to discern your plan for our lives. We want to make this personal, not just head knowledge, but Lord, that you would show us the path you want us on. And then finally, Lord, we're asking for courage. We need your courage because as you challenge us with your word, we need courage to act. So we pray for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Ephesians, I want to give you a little bit of an overview. If you missed last week when Pastor Chris kind of set the table of what the book of Ephesians is all about, it was written in about 60 to 70 A.D., about 2,000 years ago, and it was written to a church that is right here, on this map. You see Ephesus there? That is the very western part of the nation that we now refer to as Turkey. So that right there is Ephesus. And then as you can see, follow the shoreline there of the Mediterranean Sea all the way down to the bottom sea where it says Israel. Right there, our video that we saw this morning with Pastor Chris and Connor, that's where our friends, more than 20 people are right now. They're in Israel. But actually, check this out. Here's kind of a cool full circle moment. We are studying Ephesians and the church in Ephesus right there in Turkey. Did you know that on the way, their flights to Israel, they connected in Turkey. Pastor Chris and that team, they are so dedicated to this message series. They're like, we're going to fly through there and check things out for ourselves just to make sure we're teaching things right. That's dedication. So I just want you to understand the place that we're talking about and the time again, around 60 or 70 A.D., this was written to a church at a specific time with a specific need. But here's the amazing thing. We believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this message has value for us today. This letter was preserved 2,000 years that we might discern something for it for ourselves. And that's what we're here today to do. We're here to study this and understand, Lord, challenge me with your word. I want to know more about you. I want to know more about myself through this. I want to know more about your plan for my life. So as we continue, the passage we read this morning, as we read it off the screen, the first word we saw was the word finally. Anytime you see the word finally, you know something came before. So let me just share a little bit about that. If you're not familiar with the book of Ephesians, Ephesians has six chapters. So we're about five and a half chapters deep where we start today. And the five and a half chapters that precede what we read today have to do with this. Paul touches on these really cool themes. First, that we were chosen by God, that we were made alive in Christ, that God's plan is for all people, not just the Jews, but for all people, including Gentiles. 
See, the church in Ephesus, this was comprised of people who were not historically or ethnically Jewish. They were not God's chosen people. And yet, Paul explains, just as Jesus said, his plan of salvation, this plan that we're reading about, it's for all people. It's for you, it's for me, it's for all nations. In chapter 4, Paul writes that we are all one in Christ. It's a beautiful chapter. I encourage you to read it sometime this week. And then in, finally in chapter 5, Paul encourages us to live holy lives in submission to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. So that's all that he's building as a foundation for what he's bringing us today. All of that brings us to the finally that we read. And here, Paul is giving us an exhortation to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He challenges us to put on what he calls the armor of God. And he begins with this encouragement. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. He's saying this. He's saying take truth and fasten it around you. Make sure you have it secured to you. Don't lose it. You know, I'm going to share um, an illustration. I think it sums this up so perfectly. It's a great visual. How many of you ever traveled overseas? Raise your hand if you traveled overseas. I know, yep, you traveled overseas. Yep, you, you, I see. About half the room traveled overseas. Now, many of you, as you've traveled in different nations, you've been warned by tour guides, travel guides, or maybe by the locals. They're like, watch out. Watch your valuables. Watch your purse. Watch your wallet. Don't put your wallet in your back pocket. Why? Because some of these places you go to, they know you're a a traveler or a tourist, and they target you, and they are good. Let me tell you, I remember being in Vatican City years ago. You know, Vatican City is this holy city, right? Head of the Catholic Church. The pickpockets are bad right there. Watch out. I remember being in Italy once, sitting on a train, waiting for it to depart. It's just sitting there idling, waiting for the doors to close. We're going to begin our journey to the next city. There's a young woman, a few rows in front of me, right about there. She's just on her phone, just looking at her phone right there. And the guy timed it perfectly. Just as the train was starting and those doors were closing, he ran up the aisle, grabbed her phone, ran out those doors. And I promise you, she never saw that phone again. In that way, Paul is saying, secure truth like a belt around your waist. And I want to give you a visual. Many people as they travel, maybe one of you here in this room would have one. It's called a travel security belt. A travel security belt is this thing, rather than putting your wallet in your back pocket, you put it in this zippered pouch that is then buckled around your waist, underneath your clothing, so pickpockets don't have easy access to it. They'd have a hard time grabbing up under your shirt, unzipping that pocket and grabbing your wallet that way. In that same way, Paul is saying secure truth around your waist, just like a travel security belt. Don't let it slip from you. Now this word truth. I want to share with you this concept as it relates to the Bible in the New Testament. It comes from a word in Greek, aletheia. Everyone say aletheia. Aletheia is your Greek lesson for this day. Aletheia appears in the New Testament 110 times because, yes, most of the New Testament is written in Greek originally. And aletheia simply means truth. It is that concept of truth that we're going to be reading about more today. Jesus said this word Aletheia, many times as recorded in the Gospels. And we see here in John, the Gospel of John, three instances, very famous instances where he refers to truth. Jesus said, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and truth. Jesus also said, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then finally, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. We sang that this morning. Remember, we sang that. No one comes to the Father except through me. In reading the Gospels, it becomes very clear that this concept of truth is really important to Jesus. He refers to it often, and he even calls himself the way, the truth, and the life. What that means is that Jesus himself is the the personification of truth itself, and that's an important thing to know. We want to remember that as we continue studying this. But, you know, all of this we're kind of assuming something, and that is that we all have like a working definition of what truth is. And that is really, um, it's a dangerous assumption to make in this world today, isn't it? That's a big question. What is truth? What is truth? For a lot of people, they've made truth very personal. You ever heard people refer to my truth? I want to hear your truth. Please share your truth. I want to share my truth. You ever heard that before? 
I hear that a lot. That is a very common thing in modern vernacular. I know where it comes from. I understand the intent. The intent is this, and there's truth behind this, that everyone's experience is different. And how we perceive the world, our feelings, our experiences, everyone's is different. I understand that. I respect that. In that sense, your truth is going to be different from my truth. I get that. But here's where I draw the line. I draw the line at this notion that there is no universal truth. Universal truth is what we're talking about here, and that is what Jesus is referring to. Not my truth or your truth. It's a universal truth upon which the foundation of our faith stands. And without that, our faith just crumbles. So what is truth? That's a question that Pontius Pilate asked at the trial of Jesus Christ. We see recorded in John 18. Let me set the scene a little bit. Jesus, who had done nothing wrong, is on trial for his life. And a great mob had been stirred up by the leaders of the church of the day because they didn't like Jesus. He was a threat to their power. He didn't like one bit what he was doing. And therefore, they stirred up a lot of trouble for Jesus. And he's on trial. And the person presiding over this trial is is not one of God's holy people. He's not a, a Pharisee. He's not a priest. He's not even a judge. He is the governor of Judea. His name is Pontius Pilate. He's a Roman leader. And he's judging these people he's supposed to oversee. And frankly, you kind of get the sense, as Pontius Pilate is dealing with this, he doesn't want anything to do with this. He's forced into this. And so he's basically examining Jesus by asking questions. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now check out Pilate's response. This is great. What is truth, retorted Pilate. What is truth? Basically, I mean, we can't really get completely inside Pilate's head, but I have to imagine it was a little something like this. He's frustrated. He's like, you know, you Jews have your ways, and I don't get you guys. I don't know why I'm even here. So you guys have your truth, I have mine. So what does truth have to do with any of this? Because we can't even agree on the basic definition of truth. Any of you ever experienced that? Maybe you're sitting over across the dinner table from a loved one, and you guys can't even agree on the basic facts of life, the truth of things that have occurred in our nation, in our world. It's incredibly frustrating, isn't it, to try to find a basis, a foundation with which we can agree. And that's really what we're trying to do here. So we're going to back everything up. We're not going to make this about our personal experience or a political creed or anything like that. We're going to look to the Bible for a definition of truth. And I believe in studying the totality of Scripture and understanding what God's Word says about Scripture, I think John MacArthur's quote really puts it succinctly. I want to share this quote with you. John MacArthur wrote, Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God. Let me say that again. Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God. I think if you take that quote and hold it up to the totality of Scripture, that holds up. It is a concise way of defining truth through the lens of what God wants us to understand it as. So when we're talking about what is truth, I think that's it right there. To live in truth is to live in consistency with the mind, will, character, glory, and being of God himself. And Jesus, again, remember, he is the personification of truth because Jesus himself is God. So why do we need truth? I mean, it's one thing to just say, all right, there's truth, there's a definition. But, you know, a lot of people would question the authority of the Bible and why. Okay, let's just assume for a second that the Bible is truth. Why do I even need it? I'm doing just fine without it. Well, let me explain. Why would we need truth? I submit this, that without a compass for our life to guide us, we tend to descend into this natural inclination towards selfishness. We don't have to be taught. We are inborn with this need to kind of please ourselves, and selfishness is the root of all conflict. If we're wondering why there's unrest between Israelis and Palestinians in the Middle East, selfishness. Conflict rooted in selfishness. We're wondering why Russia invaded Ukraine and there's war going on between millions of people in Eastern Europe. Why? Selfishness. Different people want different things. Somebody wants it, they want to take it. The other person wants to defend to the point of death, conflict. War is rooted in selfishness. But not even on these big political scales, on the, on the little things. Divorce is rooted in, ultimately, hurt, pain, and selfishness. 
our conflict that we have one-on-one between our loved ones, our neighbors, the people we interact with, it's because we don't listen to God's will for our lives. Instead, we follow our own heart. Proverbs 20, verse 2 puts it like this. Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. It's really easy. I mean, I do it all the time. I justify my bad behavior thinking, well, I'm okay. It was a moment of weakness. Other people are far worse than me. In my own eyes, my tendency is to justify my own behavior. But the thing is, that's not the standard of truth. The standard of truth is that which is in alignment with God's will and character. And so we must be in alignment with that or we're not living in truth. Why do we need truth? Without it, our decisions descend into chaos. And we live in a world already filled with chaos. Are we adding to that chaos or are we bringing peace and truth by God's spirit? So now we come to the last question. If we assume now that we can know truth and that truth is something that we want, how would we go about equipping ourselves with truth? How can we be equipped with truth? Well, the first way is this. I would say this. This is a great aim. Pursuing Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is the number one way that we can know truth. And why is that? Because Jesus said what? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He said, I am the truth. So the more we come into alignment, the more we know him, the more we follow him, the more we are living in alignment with truth. We can be equipped with truth by knowing him better and following him better. Okay? So what are practical ways that we do that? Well, one of them is what we're doing right here. We spend time in studying his word. Why do we do this? Every Saturday, every Sunday when we have a worship service, we set aside a part of the service for reading God's word. It's because we want to know the truth. We want to be not just listening to, but challenged by the word of God. It's not enough to just have it here. We want to bring it right here. And being challenged by the word of God is how we are sharp and how we are equipped with the truth. And it's not just in big public settings like this. It can also be privately, one-on-one, just you, yourself, maybe your Bible, just spending time with God. But there's another beautiful way. I want to encourage you this. How many of you here are part of an active life group right now? Whether in our church or another fellowship group? Good, I see hands all over. I must see 25, 30 hands. That's great. This is a great thing because life groups are a great way for us to pursue truth together. We study God's word or read a book together. We spend time in fellowship. But most importantly, this is, this is my favorite part of life groups, that we talk, that we discuss the big ideas. And in searching for those ideas together, I believe there's wisdom that can be found. We're equipped with truth by spending time with other believers That's another way for us to find truth, a practical step. Can I give you one more practical step this morning? I want to challenge you with something. It might put you outside of your comfort zone a little bit. Memorizing scripture is a wonderful way to be equipped with the truth. You know, last week as Pastor Chris was reading Ephesians 6, remember what he said? He's like, you know, he challenged us to memorize this passage. How many people memorized Ephesians 6 this past week? Did you really, Kathy? Good job. Nicely done. Well, I'm, I don't think any of us have got 6, 10 through 20, right? That's a lot of words. But I'll tell you what. You got to start on it. Jamie, I see you talking over there. You got to start on it. I got to start on it. And this morning, we're going to get a start on it. Because I believe 100% that memorizing scripture is such an effective tool in equipping ourselves with truth. Samuel, I remember at one point you memorized a big part of this scripture right here. So we're going to work on this together this morning. Brenda, will you put up, we're going to look at Ephesians 6, 12. Let's just read it off the screen together. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's just one of the verses. But to me, I would say if you're going to learn anything in this, This might be the key verse to learn, and I'll explain why. You know, just just memorizing something to memorize it, what's the value in that? The reason we would memorize this is we want to make it a heart thing. So when we go through a crisis, when we are confronted with someone, and we feel like that, that guy right there, he's the enemy, this is a reminder. We don't struggle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the principalities, the dark forces of this world. Those are our true enemies. They lie beneath, we cannot see, but that is the true struggle that's going on. Let's read this again. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I don't know how you would do this. Everyone's got a different method in learning scripture. Some people, it's just you read it, and you read it, and you read it. Some people say it out loud. Some people would take it and print it out, and you'd tape it up to your bedroom mirror, and you just every morning you're reading it, and before you go to bed you're reading it. Whatever works for you, I encourage you. Let's take up Pastor Chris on this challenge. Imagine, he comes back from Israel this week, and we've got this verse down. He'd be like, wow, they listened to me. <laughs> how cool would that be? Again, I'm going to tell you, in the battles of life, how great is it to be equipped? Not with, well, let me go look for this verse. I don't remember what it said, but let me go see if I can find it. To have it in here and memorized. If we're looking to gird truth around our, our, our waist like a belt, there's no better way than to hide it in our hearts. Psalm 119, 12. Your word, O Lord, I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorizing scripture is something we've kind of forgotten how to do. And I know we, many of you are saying, you're like, I'm just not good at that. I can't memorize that. Oh, hang on a second. I saw a whole bunch of kids over here earlier. Some as, as, as little as five or six or seven years old. And I know part of their curriculum is learning Bible verses. Right, Charlie? They learn those Bible verses. Last week for our communion or our, our confirmation service, there were 16 of our eighth graders who came up here and they recited the verses they memorized. Right, Grace? So if they can do it, can we do it? Nobody responded. If they can do it, can we do it? Yes, we can. Let's do it one more time. Let's read it from the screen. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is your next step for this week. We believe at this church in giving next steps. You know, it's one thing to just Read the word and say, that's nice. Close it and we're just done. We forget all about it. To put it into practice is a beautiful thing. This week, I challenge you to put it in practice. And yes, I'm going to check up on y'all next week, all right? As you're able, will you stand with me? We're going to worship in a moment. We're going to continue singing about how good God is to us. And the reason we do this, we gather together for worship, prayer, testimony, reading the word, being challenged by the word, is this. We need a constant reinforcement, a constant reminder that these battles that we're in, we don't fight alone. We need to be yielded to his will. We need to be reoriented to that true north of God's truth, not our own. So let's pray on that right now. Lord, we thank you that in all things that we read in your word, there's always a message for us. It might be difficult to discern at times, but Lord, by your spirit, we thank you for giving us wisdom to understand it and how it applies to our lives. Now, Lord, as we worship you, we pray that you continue speaking to us. As we worship you, may you enter our hearts. Show us something new about your character, even as we bless you. Lord, we thank you that you're always faithful. When we open our hearts to you, you're faithful to show us something new. So we do that right now. We open our hearts to you in our lives, giving you ourselves in worship. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.